Three things were obvious. First, he loves that song. Second, he can play the guitar. And third, he's got a beautiful voice. The perfect person to speak to Rush on their induction in the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Maybe it's the growing up in Etobicoke, a vast suburb similar to the places where Rush came from. Or maybe it was through his music with the Rio Statics that was also uncompromising and boldly original. He has also written eight books, including On a Cold Road and the recent Around the World in 57 and a half gigs. But most importantly, uh, like Jacob, he's a Rush fan. Yeah. And here to read from his book, For Those About to Rock, please welcome Dave Bedini. As a kid in love with rock and roll, Rush was the first real band with whom I was obsessed. I was partly in a rush because as a 14-year-old kid, I wanted to appear older. Most of the kids two grades above me were into Rush, partly because, like tobogganing and watching the beach homers, to follow them was to quietly awaken one's sense of place. So if you weren't into Rush or into disco, it was an impossible choice. <laughs> it was broken down along these lines, Rush was the only band every guy in my neighborhood cared about. With Lakeside Park from Rush's All the World Stage Live album, recorded over three nights in Mass Hall, for the first time, I identified a local place in a song. Not just a song, mind you, but a kick-ass chunk of molten metal prog rock, embellished with roller coaster drum fills, chiming guitar flurries, and Getty Lee's wild vocals. In other books, I've stated the effect that Tom and Tom Connors has had on my life, but it was Rush, and to a lesser extent, their cousins in the song, Max Webster, who first sang to me about my home. Around the time that I got into Rush, I met Ronnie. We were 13 years old, and we were both crazy about the band. I first encountered him while walking down the hallway of my high school. At the time, I was wearing my t-shirt with Rush 1 Toronto, spelled on it, which I had seen press on in spongy white letters at the t-shirt stall in the Albion Mall. <laughs> you like Rush? You yeah. asked me? Yeah, yeah, man, I love Rush. Cool, cool. wanna hang out? Okay. <laughs> Ronnie was a guitar player, and he was way better than me. Not only could he play Alex Lifeson's solos note for note, but he also looked the part. Scrawny and skinny leg with long blonde hair spilling over his shoulders. The Ronnie lived in a bungalow near Silver Creek Park with his mom and dad, his brother Rob, and two families and aunts. He looked like he'd woken up in a gulch. His face was moody and drawn without ever having touched over booze or speed. And the way he wore his guitar, a sunburst less fall with white humbuckers and gold knobs among low across his midriff, suggested that he had it strapped across his bony shoulder since birth. Ronnie was the real thing. I was envious of him from the beginning. Ronnie and I started to jam. We sat at the edge of each other's beds on numberless afternoons, watched over by Rush's Farewell to King's Poster. Giddy Lee, Alice Lifeson, and Neil Peart standing arms crossed in front of a castle, long, greasy hair dripping down their backs. And we strummed along to the records. Actually, Ronnie did most of the strumming. I studied them closely, copying riffs of Bastille Day, Temples of Syrians, and of course, Xanadu, Rush's monumental work of oscillating synths, wind chimes, epic poetry, and fast hiccuping bass lines. Ronnie and I saw lots of rock shows together, but most importantly, we saw Rush twice, the last time at the Gardens on their Hemispheres tour. One of the best moments came during the flashbot blasts and closer to the heart, when the whole crowd came alight, 16,000 faces hanging open as Alex, in his fringe robe, harangued a D major chord, his wild eyes obscured by a car wash curtain of hair that whipped across his face as we gaveled pangs of delight. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Like a lot of kid friendships, the one between Ronnie and me stood last. With the passing of time, as we heard of grades in middle and high school, my ideas about music started to evolve. Soon I got into punk rock, and this drove a wedge between Ronnie and I, and it happens. With change, certain people come to represent what it used to be, 
And that, and that was, was the case, case with Ron and Rob for me. For me. I made, I made new friends, friends, got into new bands, dressed, dressed differently. One, One weekend, I begged my parents to let me have a new wave party. They just said that I could. I didn't invite Ronnie. <laughs> Sometime during the party, there was a pounding on the door. When, when I opened it, Ronnie, Rob, and about five of their friends charged into the hallway. Ronnie waved an exacto knife and he came at me. He slashed the air and he screamed my name. I fell backwards against the stairs, holding up my hand for Ronnie to stop, but he wouldn't. It was a bewildering scene. My, My friends rushed up from the basement. Kenny Huff grabbed Ronnie and pushed him out of the front door. After a struggle on the driveway, he climbed back into his car. He had this strange, twisted look on his face. And as the car pulled away, one of his friends shouted out the window that he was going to find me after school and break my fingers. I thought of Ronnie, and I thought of Rob, and the real static got to record with Neil Peart in 1992. Neil came down to Reaction Studios while we were making our whale music album and set up a little yellow jazz kit in the corner. The Vernica ladies were there too, singing backup vocals. We all huddled together and watched as Neil warmed up on his kit. Gone was his wild, viney hair, fringe robe, and shaggy mustache, but he was still a ghostly figure under the low studio lights. Head lowered, torso centered, feet kicking, his hands glancing over the drums. Neil played all afternoon. We were glued to the carpet, aware that we were listening to one of the greatest drummers in the history of music play. It's one thing to see your hero perform from a faraway scene in Maple Leaf Gardens, but it's something else to be so near to his work as I was that day. Once upon a time in my life, I dreamed of what it would be like to merely attend a Russian concert. Even before that, I had put my time after school around a chance encounter to see their video for Closer to Heart on TV. And yet there I was, sitting on the studio parquet, not 20 feet from where he was crafting the part for a song that would appear on our album. While Neil played, I thought about Ronnie. How he used to bend the fat strings of his Les Paul to play the vibrato riff of what you're doing. His skinny wrists working in the neck, his tongue curved over his lip, trying to get the riff just right. I thought about the sound of the suburbs, the sound of Rush, and what it had taken for me to be where I was living this rock and roll dream. As Neil commanded his kit, he painted my adolescence before me, evoking everything about it. And even though I sat alone, I imagined that Ronnie was there too, watching our hero as he played and played and played, tapping out rhythms of the heart for a kid who was once best friends with another kid. And they love to rush. And tonight, they're the modern era inductees into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame. Giddy, Al Sinero. Yeah.